quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Sitting across the council for me today, he likes to call himself a wannabe rock star. However, I've seen this gentleman perform. He is a rock star. Doug Songai Robertson is in the studio. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Glad you could make it today. Very kind introduction. <laughs> well, you're a kind guy, so there you well, go. I'm some kind of guy, that's Way for sure. You are some kind of guy. I can tell this show's going to go downhill already. Hey, question for you. You started in the business rather young. You were nine years old. You oh, started yeah. ripping off other artists' music. Yeah, my grandmother actually, uh, I was over at her house for dinner and I was nine years old and she brings me into the living room saying, I want, want you to listen to this musical group. And I'm being a nice grandson and walking in very pleasantly, but in my mind I'm thinking, oh no, she wants me to watch Lawrence Welk with her. It ended up, it was the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Wow. Although the band was pretty good, I did enjoy their music, it was the girls in the audience that got my attention. Hey, I think it got all of our attention back then. Uh, yeah, I tell you, I decided I want some of that. So I've been uh, trying to get girls uh, screaming after me ever since, and it has worked. It has worked. Usually it's because of money issues or uh, something along here. those lines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it, I, I did get flashed once at a show. By, which by, is every, by a girl? By a girl. Okay. Every rock and roll man's dream is to have girls flashing you at the show. And, and sure enough, I, I was at this performance and I was in the middle performing and this gal came walking down the aisle and she pulled up her blouse and there was nothing under it. Uh, unfortunately, she was about 95 years old <laughs> and this was at a memory care facility. <laughs> But uh, I, I do have the creds now. I've I've been flashed. Hey, memory the show. care facility. You know the Ryman Auditorium doesn't matter. Does hey, it? it was female. You know. Yeah. There you go. When did you decide that this was something you wanted to do seriously as a career? Were you this nine-year-old kid and said, hey, this is the, the girl screaming, I want a part of that? Or did something click a little later on in life? Or? No, it, it clicked right then. And yeah. I, I learned guitar and uh, I did everything I could to try to become a rock star. I grew up in L.A., so I was around it all the time. I studied uh, music writing, a uh, songwriting under John Berhaney and Al Kasha, yeah. uh, which are very well-known names in the songwriting business. So I, I was serious about it, uh, not serious enough to follow their advice. I kept writing horrible songs, but I, I did keep trying to go after the, the rock star thing. I enjoyed doing it, but I became that guy that was always in the rock band on the weekends at, at the club, but never quite made it. I was around it, and I was around people that were famous and moving on to great success, but I wasn't the guy that got it. And I kind of like being there. There's a whole lot of pressure that is not on me. Uh, as I watch their careers and I watch what they have to go through in order to sustain what they have, I'm kind of glad that I've been able to kind of skate through it. And I, I really think that my kind of music is more relatable to the guys that tried and failed than the guys that made it. And we're going to talk about that in, in a bit because you have a new album coming out November 30th called Epiphany. And we're going to talk about that song, Why Are Armadillos in Nashville? And if anybody follows me on Facebook, you'll see we, we actually shot a music video we did. on this song. And that song became an earworm for me. And it was three or four days later, I was still singing it. So that's, that says something. 
Let's jump back a little bit. Let's go back to 1996. You recorded your first solo album, New Clothes. And when it was released, a radio personality said, hey, here's that song guy named Doug Robertson. And that mm-hmm. kind of stuck with you. It did. And, and it was actually, he's a national radio host now, a conservative talk show host. It is Rusty Humphreys actually named me song guy in reno nevada when he was uh, back there so wow. uh, so that nickname did stick so i'm called song guy by uh, some of my friends so all these years later yeah and then of course you also for a, a period of time 14 years i guess we could say you were the co-coordinator of the nashville songwriters association international reno nevada workshop talk about that one for a minute that was really neat. I had been involved with John Brahaney's group in Los Angeles, which was Los Angeles Alternative Chorus Songwriter Showcase, which I've always loved that title because in songwriting, you always want brevity. And I just thought that was so ironic. But in Reno, I didn't know of any groups doing that. And I came across a friend of mine, a co-writer of mine, who had become one of the coordinators for NSAI in Reno. We happened to be meeting at the manager's office for Colin Ray. Uh, His manager lived in Reno and had an office. Yeah. And so we started out there in his office and kind of developed from there. And uh, so I went to conventions, learned more about songwriting and learned how to teach other people about songwriting. When you started doing that, especially uh, around people like Colin Ray, were there other singer-songwriters that had influenced you up to that point? Now, you mentioned the Beatles, and you've performed with, with other artists. you performed with Johnny Rivers, and I like this, Leonard Nimoy. We had someone on the show a while back who had actually done some work with William Shatner. So we're covering the entire Star Trek base here That's on the right. show. Live long and prosper. That's right. <laughs> uh, of course, Len Chandler and Al Jarreau, one of my favorites. But was there somebody that either you had worked with or you emulated or you aspired to be along with the Beatles as you got into that songwriting world of yours? I was really, I I thought that my major influence was the Beatles and my writing until I, at the same time, I was joining a tribute band. And as I was doing that, I was learning all these cover songs and we started coming across America. I was realizing that a lot of my song structure was a lot like America. The courting and the development and how the emotion in the song. And you're talking about the group America. The band America. Yeah, the yes. band America. I acclaim McCartney and, uh, and Lennon as my heroes, but it was actually uh, Dan Peake was a big one and, and Jerry and, and those guys. Did you have a chance to get to work with them ever or meet no, with them? Or? No, never met them. Yeah. I, I did meet Dan Peake. I take that back. I, yeah. So now you're into songwriting, you're getting some radio play, and this tribute band, was this Max Yasger's Farm or was it this was. before that? If anybody's a Woodstock fan, they're going to know who Max Yasger is. Right. Why that name? Why that period? I had an agent that wanted to book us. And at that point, I was called Doug Robertson and Company. As any agent will tell you, nobody's ever heard of Doug Robertson, and they're not going to book uh, an act like that because they have no idea what that means. So uh, he was saying, find a name that's very 60s sounding. And they had the, uh, you know, big electronic orchestras or uh, Sly and the Family Stone. And uh, there were a lot of names like that, multiple word names. And so he said, come up with something like that. So we were throwing around a bunch of different names. And since we were leaning towards the Woodstock era, not just the Woodstock itself, but the whole era, we decided, why don't we just call ourselves from the farm, Max Yasger's Farm, where Woodstock was held. Was that the generation of music you were focusing on? Yes. Did did you build it around the acts that performed at Woodstock, or were you just kind of taking everybody in from that era? We were taking everybody from the era. We we did focus a lot on on the songs from that, but uh, we were doing everything from Arlo Guthrie to Hendrix. That is a big, wide swath of of artistic cloth there. It is. Uh, So it it was a lot of fun doing that. And and I'm very proud of myself uh, being a guitarist. I would bring only two guitars on stage. Any guitarist will tell you you're nuts if you're doing that. You need at least 12 different guitars if you're going to be doing that wide a swath. 
Yeah. I brought a computerized guitar called a Variax that emulates different guitars, even 12 strings and sitars and banjos. So it'll emulate any kind of guitar. And I had a pedal from the same company, Line 6, that emulates amplifiers and different pedals. So we were doing the Birds and we were doing Hendrix and we'd be doing uh, Cream and then we'd be doing, like I said, Arlo Guthrie. Well, is that something you still perform with or do you still have it? I still have it yeah. and I still use it uh, sometimes in performance, but the other instrument is my acoustic guitar and I've always preferred acoustic guitar without any effects. I, I just love the sound of that wooden sound of a good guitar. We're going to take a break, get a word in to one of our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with this song guy here, Doug Robertson. This is Gary Chapman, and you're listening to the Business Side of Music podcast. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Tom Sabella, the creator, founder, and co-producer of the Business Side of Music podcast. It's loyal listeners such as yourself that make our podcast successful. Take the time to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Not only does it contain information on upcoming podcast episodes, but also informative tidbits on the music industry and even bonus items that we give away. All you have to do is sign up at businesssideofmusic.com and we will send you Larry Butler's new singer-songwriter rulebook. That's it. All you have to do is go to businesssideofmusic.com, sign up, and we will send you Larry Butler's new book. Thanks to all our loyal listeners. We love you. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio, sitting across the console from me, song guy. Doug Robertson's here in the studio with us today. You recently shot a music video. Yes. Which I had the honor to be a part of. Thank you very much. Why are armadillos in Nashville? And this song is coming out November 16th. Now, I did some reading. When I first moved to Nashville in 1998, there weren't armadillos here. They mm -hmm. were pretty much a Texas, Arkansas thing. But now they're here. Yeah. Why? Well, you want the real reason or you want my reason? Uh, let's go with, why don't you just do an amalgamation of both? <laughs> when I always was fascinated with armadillos from a kid, uh, I would watch the old uh, cartoons uh, and they'd have armadillos doing weird things. And it was always associated with Texas. There's actually a 1948 Disney cartoon with Pluto and the armadillo. Uh, where the armadillo rolls up in a ball and Pluto mistakes it for a ball and he's playing ball with Mickey Mouse. Is So I remember those kind of things. So when I moved from Reno to Nashville, I drove south and hit Highway 40 and then turned left and drove all the way to Nashville. I was going through Texas and I was thoroughly expecting to be able to see an armadillo since I was going to go through Texas. Right. I didn't see a one. When I went through Arkansas, nothing, Oklahoma, nothing got into Tennessee, that's when I started seeing armadillos in Nashville, in the Nashville area. I did some study on it, and actually armadillos didn't really show up above the Rio Grande, north of the Rio Grande, until after the Civil War. And then they stayed pretty much in Texas, and more recently they've been moving north and east. I don't know why. They're actually a South American animal. Yeah, and they're now in our neighborhood, I can tell you to that personally, because we see them all the time. Yeah. But then you come up with the song, Why Are Armadillos in Nashville? Let's talk about that song for a minute, because I'm going to repeat myself. It is an earworm. When you hear the song, and we're going to play it on the show, when you hear this song, it sticks with you. Oh, thank you. I got here and uh, started thinking about why are they here? 
Well, why is anybody in Nashville? You come to Nashville to be a star. So I figured that must be why they're here. So uh, I, I wrote a song about <laughs> about that. And of, of course, they're a Texas animal. So what kind of music style would you use in writing about a Texas critter? That's right. Of course, the first thing comes to mind is Texas Swing. Yep. So I, I spent a night studying Texas Swing and uh, Bill Monroe and the Texas Playboys and all those guys. And I, I started trying to emulate the music that they were doing. I figured, learned that I don't really know how to do it very well, so I had to just kind of make it up as I went. So I ended up with uh, Wire Armadillos in Nashville as a te- my first and only Texas Swing song. And it was my very first Nashville song after I'd moved to Nashville. Wow. And you did your research you wrote this song, you got it recorded, you shot this video. And the video is interesting, too, because it's a little bit live performance. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit animation. Yes. And how, how did that concept come about? I was playing with the idea of doing some animation on it and having some animated armadillos like I'd seen in the cartoons uh, in my youth. I came across uh, someone, uh, her Facebook page is Danny Abundance. And uh, she was advertising that she could do animation. So I contacted her, and she apparently has a team that does that. So we started talking and uh, started going back and forth, and they came up with some armadillo characters that I thought were really cute and really funny. And so we worked out a script, and we worked out an idea of what these armadillos are doing. And, and, yep, they're marching from Texas into uh, Tennessee in order to become stars. Where'd you record the project? I recorded it at Azalea Studios in Brentwood uh, with Nancy Moran and Fett. Who are also in the video. Yes, uh, they, they are helping me. Na- uh, Fett is my engineer and uh, producer, and, and Nancy is a wonderful coach and friend and singer on the, on the song. Let's talk about the album now, Epiphany, which is coming out November 30th. Why are Armadillos in Nashville is obviously a Texas swing song. The rest of the album, is it is it a variation on a theme? Is it a reflection of everything you've done? Or are you going in a different direction this time? Or It goes in all kinds of directions. Uh, it's got some rock. It's got some blues. Uh, I've got a Joe Walsh style song on it. All original stuff, though. All original. Yeah. Yeah, it's all original. The theme uh, throughout it is that there's kind of a hidden meaning in each song. There's something that's kind of hidden there that you look, listen to it and you go, oh, Oh, wow, that, there's interesting little facts. Such as what? Such as the second verse on the armadillos actually talks about something that they actually do. They stand on their hind haunches. They jump up when they get startled. So little known facts. Little known facts. Yeah. And I kind of hide that in the second verse there. It's a little more funny in the second verse than it is in real life, because in real life it ends up with a dead armadillo at the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, songs. I have a song called Portola that's about a railroad worker working in a switching yard in a small town in Northern California called Portola. It's about the loneliness that that he has there. So uh, There's a lot of different themes that go on, but there's usually something, a little hidden truth or hidden something. Was the song uh, Portola, was that based on someone that you knew or you had watched? or I lived in Portola yeah. for a year. I had moved from Sacramento, lived in Portola for a year. All of you that live in small towns, God bless you. I love you so much. I can't do it. I need concrete and smog and potholes, so I moved to Nashville. But, uh, (laughs) yeah, it was about living in a small town, and uh, I did live near the railroad switching yard, and they even have a railroad museum there. So it's, it's a really cool place. Lots of noise and waking neighbors It's 3 a.m. and I'm working still So cold when there's no one No loving arms in solitude Your travels around the country have obviously influenced you musically 
getting back to, you know, when we talk about you have a kind of a Joe Walsh rocker type song on there. Any other artists on this project that I don't want to say imitate, but maybe I should say emulate on there. Other artists that may have sparked a little interest on the project Epiphany. Oh, my. Um, it's hard to say because I, I, there is this conglomeration of sounds that I, that I bring in and I just make it my own. Because, uh, like, you've got the Blah Blah Cafe, mm-hmm. which you say is a 60s California rock song. Yeah. Let's talk about that one. That one has a, a little bit of a jazz influence. It's about an actual cafe that was in Los Angeles uh, in the 70s. And this was known for a particular lifestyle that at that time was uh, behind closed doors for the most part. There was a waiter there uh, named Sally. And yes, he was a waiter. The song is about the interactions going on in within the cafe. I was very uh, uh, naive when I was uh, started playing there. And it was one of those places, there's always a place in town that you have to play there if you're going to be somebody. And, and this was one of many in Los Angeles. But I used to open up for Al Jarreau on Saturday nights. At this club? At this club. Wow. And so that was kind of a cool thing. The girls would come in, and they'd come in as a couple, and they'd sit down, and they're beautiful women. And, of course, me being my heterosexual stupid self... I'm I'm trying to get catch their eye and uh, you know give give them the eye and look at them when I'm singing the love songs and all that and all they do is kind of glare at me. It took me a while before I could figure mm. out uh, what was going on there. Hey, at least you figured it out. <laughs> and I put it into the song. I I leave nothing to to the imagination. And the life, which is uh, a tender look, you say at a roadside memorial. Yes. Let's talk about that. In Reno, uh, there was a young man that was a dirt biker. He was around 16, I think, 15 or 16. And one evening he was coming home and he was crossing this, it's, it's kind of a main drag in Reno. This gal was about 15 and a half, 16. She had just gotten her license mm-hmm. and she's driving along. As she's coming along, she's driving into the sunset. So she's blinded by the sunset when this kid crosses in front of her where she hits him. And there ended up being a roadside memorial at that corner. Uh, It had been there for a couple of years, and I had attempted to write about it. And and kind of one of the rules that I I try to do when songwriting is I believe that you need to say it without saying it. And so try and find different ways to say things, but also figure out what the rules are and then figure out a way to break them and get away with it. And I was trying to do that, this song. I was trying to write a rock song uh, or some up sounding song about this roadside memorial. Uh, It ended up that I couldn't. Uh, Rick Campbell, or Rich Campbell, came into my life, and uh, he's another songwriter from Nashville, and he helped me kind of work through getting the lyrics and getting the music together. It ended up being what it should be, a, a tender song about this roadside memorial, but you don't know that that's what it is until you're about halfway through the song. a corner that everyone knows of A clint of metal on the sign caught my eye It's where moments are captured in a heartbeat Sometimes we see it, sometimes we drive by Model airplanes, a slot car and a class ring Photos of old dogs and dirt bikes Toys and gadgets, pictures and flowers At the corner they're fresh every night And the young girl drives the first time And is blinded by the sunlight Doesn't see him at the crossing and the line And the light. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. We come back, 
We're going to find out how we can get this album from Doug Songai Robertson. Hi, this is Karina Rose Logston with High Fidelity, and I'm sitting here with my pal Bob Bender sharing my expertise and wisdom here on the business side of music. Stay tuned. You're listening to the business side of music. Hey, it's Chris SD from Sync Songwriter. Imagine what it would be like getting your music into the latest TV shows, movies, or ads. Your songs would not only get exposure in front of millions of viewers, you'd get paid to do it and gain a reputation as the songwriter that you are. I've been showing songwriters, composers, and artists how to get their music into TV and film for over 15 years. Collectively, they have generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from licensing their music. Their music has been on networks such as HBO, Bravo, ABC, NBC, Netflix, and more. In films or trailers such as Predator, Annihilation, Christmas Chronicles, Professor Mac, and many others. So many songwriters upload their music to websites hoping to get discovered. Unfortunately, this almost never happens with the millions of songs out there competing for attention. I show you how to get your music heard by the people who can actually make it happen for you. When you start getting your music licensed, you automatically develop a reputation in the industry. This lets you get syncs over and over again. If you'd like to discover how to connect with the right people in music licensing, just click the Sync Songwriter logo on the Business Side of Music webpage, and I'll see you there. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio, sitting across the console from me, Doug Songai Robertson is here. I can't wait to get this album, not just because of why our Armadillas in Nashville is the perfect earworm song, but it, it just sounds like you've got a lot of great music on here. Uh, November 30th, it's coming out. Is it a digital release or will it be a physical release too? Or? It's a digital release. I am going to make a limited number of albums uh, for it for live sale at, at live concerts. But it's largely digital. Uh, you can get it on Spotify, any of the music platforms, at Apple or Spotify. You can go to my website at songguy.com. By the way, that's only one G, S-O-N-G-U-Y. Uh, you can purchase it there, but it'll be available everywhere. Let's talk about touring, because obviously 2020 is really kind of put a damper on all of it. It did. You planning on getting out next year as soon as they lift this pandemic? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we had been putting together a show with Fett and Nancy and myself for quite a while now <laughs> since uh, we've had to put it off for the pandemic. It's called Retrospective of a Western Hippie. What is it now? Retrospective of a Western Hippie. Wow. And we're hoping to get into theaters uh, with that. And what it is, I'm using my original songs, uh, many from my New Clothes album back in the 60s and uh, a lot of the songs that we did with Max Shasker's Farm and uh, my originals that are coming out now. And using those songs, the, the cover songs are kind of putting the setting there. And the original songs are telling the story, uh, such as the song about the Blah Blah Cafe and the things that happen there. And the theme and the storyline of the whole m musical is about this guy that was a wannabe rock star that attempted to get there and failed. And it's not a, oh, that's too bad that he failed. It's, I say, uh, did he find success? Or, or did he find love? Yes. Did he find success? No, but he had a blast trying. Yeah. And it's about that journey. It's about just having fun trying to be a rock star. But don't you think that if you get to a place where you're happy and you're enjoying yourself, that can be considered success? And that's exactly what the show is about. I am so happy being a song. When, when I introduce myself to uh, people in the business, they usually kind of take a second look at me. Uh, I introduce myself as my name is Doug Robertson. I've made a career of writing unpublished material. And they kind of look at me and <laughs> it takes a moment for them to register what I just said. But I do enjoy being in that place of anonymity where nobody really knows me for that, that I've just been myself and I can be myself. 
but you get to go out and make a living doing this. Yeah. Being the wannabe rock star. Mm -hmm. Wow. And people can find you on songguy.com? Yeah, that's one of the best places. Uh, my music company is Nostrabore Music. Uh, okay, you got to tell me about that. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> I think I know. Uh, I usually ask people, what do you think Nostrabore is? And, and they'll generally either come back with what it actually is, or they'll say, I think you're into uh, uh, seers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from, you know, Nostradamus and, yeah. and that sort of thing. My wife and I really enjoy strange things, and we have great humor among us. And uh, when we're taking a shower, quite often we say we're shaking a tower or uh, hoshing my wear. So one day she was trying to get my attention, and she called out, Doug. We were in a party, and there were a bunch of people around, so she calls out, Doug. Doesn't get a response. She shouts out, Robertson, and get nothing. And she says, Nostrabor! And I turn around. So that became <laughs> the thing that got my attention. So I thought that would be a good name for the music company. So it's Nostrabor Music, which is Robertson backwards. Backwards, yeah. And uh, you can go to Nostrabor Music on Instagram and find me. Doug Song Guy Robertson on Facebook. Uh, those are the two main areas. I am. I haven't quite worked out my YouTube yet, uh, but that will be... Hasn't like, we all? <laughs> that will most likely be Doug Song Guy Robertson once I get that together. Right now, it's a Doug Robertson topic. Doug, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.
tough skin out in Nashville For singing armadillo wannabes You have to have a tough skin You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.